Have you ever had the experience where you ask somebody a question and then you really wish you hadn't because then you have to listen to the answer? <laughs> well, the organizers of this conference are about to have that experience because they asked me to join these gentlemen in giving a vision talk at the end of this wonderful conference. And I suppose I'm supposed to represent or comment on the cusp of physical mathematics and string theory. Now, visions are things I associate with prophets and saints, and not being a prophet or a saint, I thought I could profit by asking for a lot of advice, and I've been doing that, and many of you in the audience can attest to that. And I also thought I could profit by looking at some of the great vision talks of the past. And surely, one of the greatest <laughs> is Hilbert's address to the Second uh, International Congress of Mathematicians, in which he begins with these resounding and magnificent words. I mean, you can hear the opening measures of Strauss's Also Sprach Zarathustra in the background. Who of us would not be glad to lift the veil behind which the future lies hidden? to cast a glance at the next advances of our science and at the secrets of its development during future centuries. What particular goals and so on. And unlike, <laughs> and unlike Strauss, he lives up to this opening because the rest of the talk is a magnificent 23 problems for the 20th century. Now, what particularly concerns us is problem six to treat by means of axioms those physical sciences in which mathematics plays an important role. Little could he know on that cold and rainy Wednesday in Paris that within two months, in a clear and mild Sunday in Berlin, Max Planck would, write, would guess his formula for the energy density of black body radiation, introducing a new constant of nature. And two months after that would give a radical derivation of that formula. So we, with our historical hindsight, can see that Hilbert and his students were missing some prerequisites. And when we teach, we know that students need to have prerequisites. Quantum mechanics or equivalent, Lorentz group, relativistic <laughs> wave equations, and so on. If then Herr Dr. Hilbert, who possessed such deep mathematical insight, could not read the simplest aspects of the quantum relativistic future in its profounder and more subtle meanings, how may unlettered Ishmael hope to read the awful Chaldee of string theory's future? <laughs> I'll do what little I can. One thing I can do is look to the past. And I want to do so briefly so that I can explain this term physical mathematics, which seems to confuse a lot of people. And I'll do that by sharing with you some snapshots from the great debate over the relation between mathematics and physics. Now, I'm not a historian or philosopher of science, but my impression is that the modern scientific era began with Copernicus, and if we look at the great figures of 16th and, century, 16th and 17th century science, like Kepler and Galileo and Newton and Leibniz, they were natural philosophers. They were not physicists. They were not mathematicians. They were natural philosophers. Now, we don't say that about scientists today. So by continuity, we can ask the question, when did natural philosophers become either physicists or mathematicians? Now, even at the beginning of the 19th century, Euler and Lagrange and Gauss were, again, natural philosophers, neither physicists nor mathematicians. But then something happened in the 19th century, because we can read in volume two of the journal Nature a pure mathematician, J.J. Sylvester, as president of the British Association saying, what is wanting is a discourse on the relation of the two branches, mathematics and physics, to and their action and reaction upon one another, a magnificent theme with which it is to be hoped that some future president will crown the edifice. That future president was James Clerk Maxwell, undoubtedly a physicist, with a very interesting address, I recommend it. And in it, 
he recommends his somewhat neglected 10-year-old theory of uh, the electromagnetic field to the mathematical community. And he's almost apologetic about it. And another theory of electricity, which I prefer. And according to Freeman Dyson, the mathematicians didn't really pay attention, constituting one of the greatest missed opportunities of all time. Now, some first-rate mathematicians did pay attention. And indeed, in the first International Congress of Mathematicians, Henri Poincaré chose as his topic on the relation of pure analysis with mathematical physics. So there are separate fields, but they still have some binding together. Now, the upheavals of the first part of the 20th century strengthened that binding quite a bit. So that we can read in Dirac's magnificent paper where he introduces three new elementary particles, an exuberant expression of the relation of mathematics and physics. The steady progress of physics requires for its theoretical formulation a mathematics that gets continually more advanced. It seems likely that this process of increasing abstraction will continue in the future and that advance in physics is to be associated with a continual modification and generalization of the axioms at the base of the mathematics. And you can read similar optimistic views of the relation of mathematics and physics in essays of Einstein from the same period. But then again, something happened because in 1972, we read in Dyson's article, as a working physicist, I am acutely aware of the fact that the marriage between mathematics and physics, which was so enormously fruitful in past centuries, has recently ended in divorce. <laughs> well, well, I am happy to report that mathematics and physics have remarried, but the relation has altered somewhat. A sea change began in the 1970s. A number of great mathematicians got interested in the physics of gauge theory and string theory, among them Michael Atiyah, Rao Bott, Graham Siegel, Is Singer, and many others. And at the same time, a number of great physicists started producing results requiring increasing mathematical sophistication, among them Sidney Coleman and Bruno Zemino, both of whom we miss. And again, many others including many of you in the audience. We know who you are. <laughs> so I would say that with a great boost from string theory, after 40 years of intellectual ferment, a new field has emerged with its own distinctive character, its own aims and values, its own standards of proof. One of the guiding principles is certainly Hilbert's sixth problem, generously interpreted discover the ultimate foundations of physics. And as predicted by Dirac, this quest has led to ever more sophisticated mathematics. But, and this is the new point, getting there is more than half the fun. If a physical insight leads to an important new result in mathematics, that is considered a great success. It is a success just as profound and notable as an experimental confirmation of a theoretical prediction. Now, I know that for some, perhaps many of you, this creed will be anathema. Indeed, it would have gone over much better two weeks ago in Edmonton, which brings me to another point. For the past four years, there's been another string theory conference with a strong mathematical bent. And these conferences have been a wonderful, roaring success. And there's a lot of energy, and they're clearly going to go on into the future. But it should also give us pause. Is this a sign of an impending divorce? We might worry, as Robert Oppenheimer said, this is a world in which each of us, knowing his limitations, knowing the evils of superficiality and the terrors of fatigue, will have to cling to what is close to him, to what he knows, to what he can do. But it's not necessarily that grim, because you see different currents of thought can coalesce with unifying principles. But only if the lines of communication are open. So let me step back and be the marriage counselor and recommend that to physics and mathematics, each should see something to love and respect in the other. 
So I urge that many of you continue to go to both strings and string math conferences. <laughs> now, speaking of the evils of superficiality and the terrors of fatigue, I ought to say something about the future. And I did think about it. And I actually put a list of concrete problems <laughs> on my home page. So you can go there and, you know, there's a, uh, this, is from, <laughs> this, is, this is from the table of contents. And there's a list of topics if uh, I try to suggest problems that I think might help lead to progress in the future. And, you know, if you ask me on a random day, I might be working on one of these topics. So I, I think of this as something where we know a lot, but there's a lot more to discover. I think of it as a continent where we have a, some foothold, maybe a few colonies, but there's this vast continent of things to discover. But what if we look further to the future? So we've been told many times that we don't know what string theory is, and we don't know what M theory is, and that is undoubtedly true. But I would submit to you that we also don't know what quantum field theory is. Now, this dovetails nicely with Yuji Tachikawa's talk. And so I just want to present some evidence that suggests that maybe there's some other formulations of quantum field theory we should be looking for. This is the big one. We have not conquered the zero two theory. Now, there were two talks at this conference where the speaker said, well, you know, the zero two theory, people usually say it's mysterious, but actually it's not that mysterious. And then those speakers went on to say, to derive very beautiful, wonderful results. But I would say that those are pieces of the zero two theory. They're applying rules in very clever ways. We could try and axiomatize the set of rules we use when deriving all this detailed knowledge of the zero two theory. But if we had such a set of axioms, that wouldn't really be a definition of the zero two theory. So no, I think they are mysterious, and that's my first piece of evidence. Some quantum field theories have no action principle and no obvious fundamental degrees of freedom. On the other hand, some quantum field theories have many action principles with totally different fundamental degrees of freedom. And even if you have an action, mathematical construction of interacting quantum field theories with running coupling constants is hard, and it has not been done for the interesting cases. Moreover, if we look at physical quantities like S matrix amplitudes, as Mike was just saying, they display much magic, and we're told they encode locality in unusual ways. Furthermore, there are theories which are neither local quantum field theories nor fully string theories, such as little string theory, brain probe theories, non-commutative field theories. I don't think they were addressed at this conference. Many non-trivial field theoretic phenomena have simple geometrical reformulations, often using compactification in brains, Fully local theories should have gluing rules for all co-dimensions. And finally, field theories are not fully defined without specifying their categories of defects. For all these reasons, this suggests that there is a new, possibly more geometric formulation of quantum field theory. How do we actually get there and do something concrete? I don't know. But possibly one way forward would be to find a general conceptual mathematical framework for the ADS-CFT correspondence. Explain ADS-CFT in all its generality to your pure mathematician friends. Now there's, I want to say a brief word about exceptional structures. These often have an aura of magic about them, related to E8 and sporadic groups. And we had two very nice talks about this at this conference from Shamit Katru and Miranda Cheng. The only thing I'll say is that, well, I cannot forecast what stormy weather our field is destined to endure. I can forecast with confidence that there will be plenty of moonshine ahead. <laughs> and about this word endure, there's an enduring question. What is M theory, which I've been trying to avoid for the last 16 minutes? Because my feeling is we're kind of stuck. I don't see a lot of papers on the archive trying to find a fundamental formulation of M-theory. So we're going to need some endurance. How do we get forward? I don't know, again. But let me make one tiny suggestion. One of the 
big lessons we learned from dbrains is that we should replace space-time with a category of dbrains. Now, in some cases, you can recover the space-time from that category. You have a linear semi-simple category. It's Hochschild cohomology, and degree zero is the functions on some space associated with that category. In general, what space-time we associate with a category of dbrains or something more general than that is something vague. Now, I stress that it's space-time that becomes non-commutative. OK, time might be non-commutative, but just now, to an excellent approximation, we're all in the same eigenstate. And so I can say with certainty that my time is up. 